All right. I am super excited to be here with Chris and Antonio, and you are a teacher at Wild Wonder. Uh, welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks, Marley. Happy to be here. Great. Well, I guess one of the first things that I wanted to ask you is, why is a, a microscope something that could be useful for people for nature journaling? It's, it's just the hidden world of the microcosm. Um, something that I'm really interested in is how uh, living things interact with living other living things and non-living things but these um interactions are happening all around us and even at the microscope level so it's just really important that you know when you're out in the field to you know look at these interactions at the macroscopic level and the microscopic level and just you know be you know for your own curiosity when you do have that leaf and you're wondering what's going on on the other side of the leaf and your iPhone only gets you so far, having yeah. a microscope really helps you um, discover more. Yeah, that's really cool. So the what you held up, it seems like something that's accessible for a lot of people. That's like a house plant, right? Yeah, like a little philodendron. So mm -hmm. um, I, I, I ripped off a couple little pieces here, but um, plants are, you know, produce their own food, right? Like when we go to the grocery store, we buy produce in the produce section because they produce their own food from uh, uh, carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight. And how they obtain that is through on the underside of the leaf is the stoma. And if you just pinch off like a little piece of the leaf and look at it underneath the microscope during the day, you can see the little stoma open in, uh, underneath the microscope with just like a regular powered microscope. And that's cool. something you can see with the naked eye. Or even um, with some aquatic plants such as Elodia, if you look at just a little tiny sprig of that under like medium power, you can even see the, the um, chloroplasts. Awesome. I think that Elodia, that brings back memories of high school biology classes. Yeah. So is this, do you think this is something like, I, I think sometimes it's important for us to talk about like nature journaling that people can do at home for a variety of reasons. Some people don't, you know, go out, out on safaris or go to exotic places where there's like big animals and, or, or whatever, even tide pools. Maybe some people might be, you know, limited to stuff that they can do from home. Do you think that a uh, microscope is something that's accessible. Could you talk about like accessibility and, and maybe cost too, because sure. I feel like cost and technology is sometimes a limiting factor as well. Yeah. Um, so inside this philodendron, um, we've got like a lot of little microorganisms and diatoms and algae and, you know, nematodes, all, all things like that. And they kind of follow a cycle. And if you look at it during different times of the year, you'll notice an abundance of um, uh, zooplankton, I would say. And then at different times, you might notice a little bit more algae. And then in the winter, you might notice a little bit more decomposers. So it's really fun and exciting to look at the same thing under the microscope um, during different times of the year as well. Cool. Uh, we, we science teachers like to have a lot of scummy pond water around our classroom just to, you know, to take a look. Um, another ex um, thing about um, accessibility is... Um, having uh, microscopes doesn't have to cost a lot. Um, they mm -hmm. make these um, fold scopes that use origami that you can use when you're out in the field. But even if you have an old microscope lying around, this is one from the 1920s that has wow. lenses from Bosch and Loam. And they're still, these lenses are still as sharp as ever. And I can they haven't changed the size of these lenses. So I can take like my new microscope and put my 25 in and it, it fits oh, wow. perfectly. I mean, <laughs> yeah, really so cool. um, I would beg borrow uh, for a microscope if you were interested um, in using uh, microscopes. Uh, lastly, two, two more things. Mm -hmm. This is the microscope um, that I have and I spent about two hundred dollars on this it's mm -hmm. a um swift i'm sorry i'm being terrible at this there we go this is a, a a swift microscope that i have and it has um 
the four um, different powers and it also has like room for a camera and then you can also change this eyepiece to a Is that tab. a dissecting microscope? No, that dissecting microscopes like have a, a flat stage. Oh. So yeah, um, this is just a, a regular compound microscope. Um, you can Do put- Do you know little, the number on that one? Uh, I don't. Uh, I can you said it was know. about $200, yeah. $239. It's a Swift microscope that I bought on Amazon. Okay. And uh, also with accessibility, mm -hmm. um, these are only $25 and for my classroom, I did a don't choose and I bought five of these and they got funded and they mailed them to my school. I'm so excited. So this can uh, be adjusted to fit on your phone, any size phone. Right. And this goes into the eyepiece so you can, um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, hard to look through a microscope especially if you're wearing glasses and then after a while you don't blink and my eyes start twitching yeah. and yeah, me too. Um, yeah. sometimes you get a little you know, fatigue and headaches but with this um but with this um but with this you know i can see what's on the microscope right and i can make it bigger or smaller oh wow yeah that's also, really handy capt yeah capture video as well and yeah. i've really um it, i'm really um loving my um phone adapter for the microscope and i believe they make these phone adapters for uh binoculars or tele for telescopes too right yeah definitely wow yeah. that's really cool because i got after your class um at the Nature Journaling Conference, I got one of these Carson ones, yeah. and I'll post the link to this. And yes. I can I can attach my phone to it, and it does make it easier looking through the phone um, sometimes instead of like yeah, getting the headache from looking through right. the, um, small eyepiece. Yeah, so it's got that part where you can attach it to your. Do you remember how to do it? <laughs> yeah, I attach. I like to attach it to my phone before okay. I. Attach my uh to the microscope okay and then i yeah. just line up the um the attachment with the camera first um and right. then i put it because sometimes microorganisms don't make the greatest model so you know if you can take yeah. a picture of it yeah like that right yeah, yeah. like that yeah, okay exactly. mm -hmm. yeah technology yeah, I'll show that in a, in a moment under my document camera too, if, if people are interested. And I'll post the link to, so the first link I posted was the Swift microscope um, that you mentioned, and then I'll post the link to the other one. And then we can um, get into the um, nature journaling from some videos that you've taken under the microscope. So um, yes. let, let me just share this link for, this is the Carson, it's the Carson. This is a very, what did you say? Is, I think this one's like 20 some dollars. So yeah, something dollars. And um, it um, needs uh, like a one double A bat, one double A bat. Exactly. Yeah. And I also just wanted to share, there's this other really small microscope. Um, this one's only 60 power, but um, a friend and one of my Patreon patrons, Beth Ann, she has the Journaling with Nature podcast. She sent me one of the, these from Australia and it's really small. I think it's for looking at, um, uh, looking for um, false currency, uh, but uh, oh, it works for nature good. journaling. I mean, I would get a headache if I was looking through it for too long, but I'll show that under the document camera okay. um, in a little bit too. But let's just jump in um, to doing some nature journaling from this video of yours. So I'm gonna share uh, the screen here and maybe we could talk about some methodology for nature journaling. And then I can also put my document camera on. So for people at home, get your sketching uh, stuff ready, your nature journaling page and materials ready so that we can do some nature journaling from this video. Could you tell us a little bit about um, what you were looking at here? Uh, yeah, I um, did a, a, the Wild Wonder Nature Journaling uh, Conference. and first. Yes, and I uh, yeah, I made some uh, backup videos just in case. 
And this video comes from Pine Lake in San Francisco, and it comes from a sample that was taken on the 15th of June. Um, I took this sample in between some reeds of Thule, so there, sunlight was able to reach the bottom of the lake, and it's in like really shallow water. So I noticed in this sample that there were a lot more um, green organisms, photosynthetic organisms than when I um, took a sample that was amongst the um, shore where the uh, dead leaves were. Okay, great. So I think the first thing here for people who are going to nature journal this then is is we often do metadata uh, yeah. when we nature journal. And so the metadata in this case, um, so here's an example of metadata when I was nature journaling from my car. That is an upcoming video. But in this case, our metadata since um, Kristen did the video and the collection is going to come from her. So um, let's see, maybe we could just say water sample. Yeah, a freshwater sample from Pine Lake. And you said you said Pine, what's it called? Pine Lake? Pine Lake. There are three natural lakes in the city of San Francisco, and Pine Lake is one of them. Okay, so I'm gonna write SF um, California. Yeah. Do you um, know an approximate date? I do. I have it, I have it um, written down. Great. <laughs> I, I have it journaled. Um, Ooh, nice. Uh, the 16th of uh, June. Okay, so that's uh, that's 6, right? 6, 16. Yeah. It was 68 degrees that day. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is easy metadata since you have all the info already. Um, it was blustery. Ooh. And then because I teach biology, we have these really long thermometers. So I brought a thermometer out there and the, the temperature of the lake was 63 degrees at the time. Okay, so, cool. So water temperature and air temperature, correct. Uh, 63 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. Okay. Um, what was the humidity of the water? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I should have, yeah. And I mean, and then the water was surprisingly clear. Okay. And then maybe what we could, what other information do you think would be useful when nature journaling a, a, a microscopic sample like this from someone else? Um, I, I, the depth, you know, because like sometimes, oh, yeah. yeah, sometimes it'd be nice if you, you know the depth, like if it was taken among the leaf litter at the shore or among yeah. the plants or the reeds, or if it was a, a dead sample from the center of the lake. Okay. And what, and, and what was the, in this case, you said it was in the tulies, but near the yeah, surface. Was, uh, like the, um, the, the sedge, right. Um, that mm -hmm. was at the edge of the, uh, the bank, the shore. Okay. Near, near shore. So probably. And then what magnification is this at? Uh, this is going to be, at, um, I, I believe I started at low power, so I, it's- um, Oh, it'll change partway through? Yeah, it'll change, yeah, so 40, 40 times magnification. Okay, so I think I'm just, for, for the metadata, I think I'm gonna just do uh, that much for the metadata. And then you also were saying that when you draw something that's under magnification, you have to draw in a circle, is that, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, when I'm drawing, when I am doing, um, uh, Mac, when, when scientists are looking at things under the microscope, it's consistent or I like them to be understood that when you're looking at something that you draw a circle to understand, to make the assumption that it's microscopic. Okay, great. Um, so let's, uh, get, if you have something round that you can trace, like a water bottle or something, use that and draw a circle. And then we can do our, the nature journaling of this next part inside of that circle. All right, there is a question from the audience. Yes. Oh, and I just wanted to say hi to a couple other people who, okay. who, start, who tuned in on the comments. I see that Esteban is here from Costa Rica and De La Luna is here. 
Um, oh, let's first answer De La Luna's question. She's asking about USB microscopes. Um, may, I don't know anything about USB microscopes. I just, because I have Mac devices, I am lucky that Hearing. So I can screen what's on my phone to my device. And then as a teacher, I can hook that up to my projector and show it. Um, with a USB device, it depends. It depends. So like the USB port on my phone would fit here at the bottom. And then that wouldn't, the cord would get in the way and mm. then it wouldn't fit in the eyepiece. So I'm sorry about that, that I don't know, but this um, USB, uh, you can buy like a USB camera for a microscope, mm -hmm. and this is the port for a camera, but why spend $300 on a camera when your iPhone does the same thing is, is mm -hmm. my um, rationale. But yeah, you could put a camera here and then hook it up as well. But I don't know, I just think it's easier with the phone for some reason. But yeah. Maybe Maybe you'll get, uh, maybe there's something I don't know about the USB cameras or the okay. software. There was um, at the first Wild Wonder conference, um, uh, the Pacific Plankton, there was a mm -hmm. guest speaker at the Wild Wonder conference in 2020, and she had used a, a USB microscope with a, a port and yeah, using images. Yeah. So that would have been Janai. Um, Ivea probably knows, um, could post a link about Janai cause, uh, she does the Pacific plankton and has a lot of resources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She would know she'd be a good source about. The okay. USB. Good question. Della. Thank you for that question. And then Ivea has a question here also. Um, Oh, whoops. Thank you. Was, no, this was what I wanted to share here. Um, for measuring humidity. Um, I have not done that yet. I mean, I do have some instruments in my classroom. In San Francisco, it's really foggy. So there is a lot of moisture uh, in the air. Um, I didn't write the time that I took the sample. But uh, sometimes I'm just guessing that maybe it would be if you check the weather on your phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, like today, it says that the humidity is 73% and it's pretty foggy outside. Technology. Sometimes you I, I have one that I've used that's like a, a thermometer and a hygrometer. And it's like, it seems like you can get ones for like 11 bucks or something that are okay. digital. Uh, yeah, they sometimes take a that. while for like if it's in your pocket, for example, and then you take it out of your pocket, you need to wait a while before the humidity uh, comes up to uh, the the ambient humidity. But I'll just post a link wow. here to um, a cheap one that I just saw. But um, and then I think thank you for that. Yeah, because I do I do have one of those um, uh, in my in my classroom. Or video. Yeah, and then the the ones that the people I think the more advanced ones for weather stuff are these like kestrels, and you like it's on a string and you spin it in the air, um, and it gets uh, temperature and humidity and all of that stuff. Well, let's go ahead and jump into some nature journaling. I'm going to play the video, um, and people can maybe people have already done a little sketch of what they see here, um, and uh, maybe I'll start with that, and then. Uh, Maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, what we see, um, what we see so far in this image. So I'll just click play here. Um, let's see. Is it going? There is a Whoa. Really, yeah, there is like a beautiful column to the drop of water. So sometimes you don't get everything clear at the same time because they're also right. sitting vertically. 
Yeah, um, the type of sl slide that I use is a cavity slide. So, you know, the the this the the, the the sample is like in a little a, a little pool itself. So that's why you might or some top swimming organisms might seem a little blurry. But I I, I think I try to change the yeah um, focus. So, I'm gonna pause it so we can, okay. can we can sketch some of the stuff that we see in there right now. Even though it's not a circle, I'm gonna still draw inside of my circle. And I would say um, I love learning that you know drawing magnified things it should be inside of a circle. But I would also say like as a recovering perfectionist, don't let that limit you from drawing things like outside of that area. So um, like one example could be. We, you could do a quick sketch maybe of of what you see in this area right now and then you could also do um like an arrow coming out and having more of a close-up or if that thing is moving you could show it um from a couple different perspectives so for example i'm noticing this this circular thing having um three uh three other circles inside of it and one of them looks kind of folded over which is interesting we could do a whole i notice i wonder it reminds me of uh with what we see in here but what i'm going to do right now is just write uh folded over or it looks folded over kristen what are we looking at here with these three circles inside of there sure um this these are called volvox um, and they are, uh, my, they're, it's a, it's a type of green algae mm -hmm. and, um, it's multicellular. So you can see that, um, the babies are having babies and then the babies are having babies, right? Oh, wow. so, <laughs> so inside here is the one organism, the Volvox. And then here are its offspring ready. You could see like the older elder shell is starting to disintegrate and i yeah you know, i'm not too sure what happened to this one maybe just like you know not everything you know produces healthy offspring right um, right yeah so what, you're, what you're saying that this um this one with the, that we can see the three inside of it is the same as the one that's next to it yes yeah and that so, this one they're just not as developed inside of here yet correct yeah, they and this are dissolve, the outer part dissolves and then these turn into separate ones. Correct. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, and they do have tiny flagella, so that's where you get that rotating movement. Oh. That's really hard to see, like, you know, with at high power with a really sharp lens or maybe some oil immersion, you can see the little flagella around it as well. And um, how do you spell the name of these? Oh, uh, Volvox is V-O-L-V-O-X. V-O-L-V-O-X. Yeah. V-O-L-V-O-X. Cool. So one... Um, some of the you know classic nature journaling techniques or approaches that could help you um, in this kind of situation would be to do a collection. So if we wanted to, we could just go through and um, with Kristen's help, um, name a bunch of these things and sort of describe them all separately. And one way that I could do that is on this page, having my main um, circle right here and then having a bunch of arrows coming out and having sort of these titles of these different um, species um, or whatever organisms, and it would be a collection of organisms. Another classic one that many of you probably know is the species profile. So we could just dive deep into Volvox and do a whole page about that organism. So those are two nature journaling techniques that we could use here. Um, another one would be um, you know, of course, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, which you should always be sort of mixing in. So maybe yes. right now would be a good time for us all to come up with some questions. Yeah. And not necessarily like questions that we want Kristen to answer, but just to practice coming up with questions. So maybe we could take a minute um, and just write down some questions that we have um, about the Volvox. 
Yeah, and I'm and I'm happy to provide additional information about it. About cool. Cool. come up with them questions. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll just play the video um, and okay. let's ask questions. I think with the video playing, it will be a good uh, good way to come up with some questions. So okay. go ahead and write down questions or observations as this um, continues to play here. Yeah, I'm wondering like the way they move the action. Yeah. So one hint, I'll give you a, a hint here about questions is if you can come up with questions that are single word questions. So just sort of riffing off what Kristen said, I just wrote movement with a question mark next to it. Sometimes when things are happening um, or you're in the field um, or there's a lot of information coming at you, being able to ask questions quickly is good. Yeah, they are magnificent organisms, you know, and um, it is hard to see, like I said, those tiny little flagella at uh, this low of magnification. Yeah. But uh, uh, I'm just wondering how the flagella beat to propel that movement. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, the spheres that you, those smaller spheres that you see inside, those are like the baby colony, baby colonies. But I think the right term is daughter colonies. Mm. Um, and they develop inside the mother. And then once they're ready to be released, the mother colony bursts and releases the babies. And then the released daughter colonies get matured and they have their babies inside them. Cool. Um, here's a question from the audience. Um, whether they're phytoplankton or not. Uh, yeah, because they are um, autotroph. They're autotroph, so they do produce their own food. Uh, yeah, they're out there, um, algae. Um, and I want to say that they're also about like a half a millimeter big in real life. But Great. they're, not, yeah, they're, they're algae, so they're not plants they are part of the protists kingdom which is like oh. odds and ends kingdom um it's plant-like and animal-like oh i always forget yeah. that so algaes are technically protists oh, not before plants. they were i mean it changes all the time like before algae was in the plant kingdom but now that we know differently it's more of a protist than a Whoa. yeah I think I always um, end up calling them plants. Okay, yeah, so fine. yeah. <laughs> this is cool. You mentioned a number. So if we're nature journaling, we should remember that we have three languages. So we've got words and images, but we don't have any numbers. At least I don't so far. So you said um, one of these is about a millimeter across. About half a millimeter. Half a millimeter. Half a millimeter. Okay. So if you have, I mean, it is if because I'm a biology teacher. And if I were to go to Carolina biological supply and buy some, purchase some Volvox from my classroom and it comes like in a, a jar, I mean, I could look and I could see the little spheres with my own eyes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. So let me add, let's add another, what organism that we can see in the, in the screen right now, should we add next? Or should um, I play it and pause? And I would say that. that also. I mean, I see grains of sand. I'm believing is a silicon oh. there that aren't moving. The great abiotic. Let's look at that. Yeah. So wh where, like that big gray thing next to one of the volvoxes? Correct. Okay, so I'm gonna draw that. So if you folks can see, because um, I think it's really important. Sometimes, in sometimes people think nature just means like living things and they forget that there's a lot of nature is not living. So um, I'm just going to draw this and then 
have an arrow coming away. So you think that's a grain of sand? I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah. Cause I, I remember when I put it on the slide, I was like, Oh, that looks like a grain of sand. I remember saying that aloud. And, and what gives you that? What tells you that? Uh, just the way, uh, the shape. Okay. It doesn't look as though it's moving. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so not moving. Yeah. It seems to be made, it reminds me of like a grain of salt or mm. sugar. Yeah. Like a crystal formation. Yeah, it has like a crystal um, look to it. Cool. It's, it is quite round though as well. Yeah. I wonder why it's round. From erosion, I think. Like, yeah. Um, interesting. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, Eva is noticing this. Do you have any thoughts on that? There's some kind of litter critter near the top center. Uh, one fourth of the size of a baby Volvox. Keep squeezing in and out near the tall. Maybe it may be, I'm putting my cursor on it. Maybe this is what he is talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I can't tell right now, but. Um, okay. Let's play the video yeah, and see. It. Let's play it a little longer. It might be a rotifer. Ooh. Oh, there it is. Yeah. It's moving. I believe it's a rotifer. Does everyone see that near the top there? Top middle? Or it could be a Daphnia, but I think the Daphnias are a lot bigger. And I think it's a type of rotifer. Okay. Tell me when when you see a good rotifer, I'll pause and we okay. can try to make your journal that one. Got it. Do you think any more show up in here? I, I, I do. I did see some more rotifers. Yes. Okay. In the um, and in case anybody wants to come back and you have a variety of these on your YouTube channel, right? Yes, I do. I have about four um, of these videos that you can watch at your own pace. They're about 10 minutes long and then you can just hit that pause button or uh, the rewind button because then that way they'll be better models. Yeah, that's great. So that is another option I wasn't even thinking of before is that makes this even more accessible is if you wanted to, you could just um, watch some of Kristen's videos. And I'm sure there's other people who have videos. Um, oh, uh, there's Microsoft. tons of stuff out there. Yeah. Are there really? There really are. There are lots of uh, really great professionals that. Um, uh, I wonder if that's a road for. High, with beautiful microscopes. Okay, great. Um, is this one in the middle of rotifer here too, you think? Uh, what color, where in the middle, is it green? Oh, mm -hmm. it, oh right there. Um, it may be, oh. okay, I think I'm changing to high power now. Okay. I mean, I'm changing to a hundred times. Before oh, was, maybe that's the tardigrade. Or Wait, what is that? Before I was at 40 magnification. Now this is a hundred magnification. Uh, this right, that right there. Now that I can see it, I can, I see a few organisms. Okay. So. Wow. This is so extraterrestrial. Yeah. Um, the one that is directly above the Volvox that is rust in color is definitely a rotifer. Okay, great. Okay, cool. Yeah. And, um, the one that is above the uh, rotifer that's a little to the left, that is called a vorticella. And uh, vorticellas are really amazing. Um, they um, also have these uh, hair-like projectiles that make these whirlpools to bring in their organisms. But they, when they snatch their organisms, they move so quickly that they have like the power of a, a jet airplane, something Whoa. like that. Like 
soup with the way they just snatch that food and move. Yeah, the super powered energy there. Okay, it looks like you're trying to focus in on something here. Yeah, I, I think I am. Uh, so look, here we go. The rotor fur looks like it's stretching out and I'm trying to get a good view of its head. Come on, rotor fur. Now would be a good time, folks, if you want to add the vorticella to or the rotifer. Just remember, we are at a different scale now. So if you're adding those into this this original drawing, to remember that there's a scale change. Yeah. Um, and that is that big gray thing is our quartz um, crystal yes. or our sand grain, right? Correct. Okay. So I'm just going to pretend I'm going to shrink my um, vorticella down to what I think is about correct size relative to that. Um, and then I'm going to add in one of these things too, even though we haven't gotten to that yet. Right. And uh, I can't see the rotor for that well, but. Okay. Okay. Tell us a little bit about, oh. oh, here we go. Maybe I'm getting, okay, go ahead. What was your question? Um, can you tell us a little, I'm going to go back here and, yeah. um, pause right here and maybe you could tell us about the vorticella. Cause I feel like we have enough of a view there to kind of do that one. Um, it sounds so, like a type of noodle. Yeah. So, uh, uh, vorticella is also, uh, a protist. It's, um, in the protozoa kingdom and it is a heterotroph which means it cannot make its own food. Uh, like the algae is an autotroph. So you have, so what the, what's funny about the protist kingdom is you have organisms that are plant-like and you have organisms that are animal-like. So uh, Vorticella, um, they are heterotrophic. So they need to get their energy by eating other organisms. Um, and they are cylindrical and bell-shaped. And um, they have this undulating cilia at the top and they have this stalk, right? And there's usually attached to a substrate. So oh. I'm guessing that this vorticella may be attached to another organism or it's attached to this um, sand grain. Like a, uh, like a sea anemone or something. Yeah, yeah, it attaches itself to a substrate. And it's about in, uh, a quarter of a millimeter big. Okay. Um, I would say that a rotor fur, they're kind of hard to see with your your eyes. How big is a rotor fur? A rotor fur is about, uh, about a half, actually about a half a millimeter to a millimeter big a rotor fur can be. Got it. Okay, so I just want to point out something from sort of a page layout perspective. I started nature journaling this vorticella up here, but I didn't leave space. You can see that if I were doing a collection um, for my visual hierarchy, it's useful to have like sand, volvox at these sort of sizes and in similar kind of writing. And I started doing all this drawing um, as Kristen was describing the vorticella, but then I kind of ran out of a space. So I'm going to have to sort of squeeze it in. Could you spell Vorta, vorticella is it v-o-r t v-o-r-t-i mm -hmm. c-e-l-l-a okay that's what i thought yeah so it kind of the vorticella latches on to like a, a decaying matter or it anchors itself to another type of substrate um I would call it epibiont, like epibiosis, where um, mm -hmm. the other organism is unbothered by the vorticella anchoring itself onto it. And yeah, those vorticella stalks that it's on, it's kind of hard to see, but it's on this thin stalk and it contracts within milliseconds when threatened. And these straw, that what makes this vorticella really interesting is the stalks have to be firm enough when they're extended, but they also have to be flexible enough to curl up. And um, I read on Wikipedia that it's called, the stalk is called a spasmonine. Um, as a, inside the stalk, it could contract so rapidly because it has power than the, uh, 
power higher than the engine of an average car, not a jet, average car. My bad. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. So, uh, yeah. And then it just um, retracts. Yeah. I'm going to play the video in case people want to try to add anything. This might be sort of like a doodle diagram or you might be able to use arrows because, of course, drawing movement is hard. But let's watch the movement because okay. you said that they're, they, these undulating cilia are basically creating a, a suction in front of the uh, vorticella, right? Correct. Let's see if we can see that um, happening here. I feel like there was a couple more moments where you could really yeah. see it moving in front of it. Oh yeah, look at that. Those things nice. got sucked right towards it. And then does that get spit out somewhere too or? Yeah, I do notice that sometimes uh, it'll get, if it's something that they don't want, it'll, it'll yeah, take, be taken out. Okay, cool. What about, uh, it looks like we're about to go over there. What are these long, these long sort of pickle shaped, like Armenian oh, cucumber things? Um, those are called uh, desmids. And uh, these other little um, green things that look like twin ovals with two little circles inside them. Oh, yeah. Like, those are called desmids, like D E S M. Wait, the, the twin ones, like um, where I'm circling right now? Oh. Yeah, that's a what about desmid. These long, what about these ones? Those are desmids as well. Okay, all right. Yeah, cool. and sometimes I get desmids and diatoms mixed up. Diatoms okay. are um, made of silica, but those are. But what we're looking at now, these are desmids, and um, they are a type of green algae, but they have no flagellae, um, and they're about uh, a half a centimeter. I mean, excuse me, about a half a millimeter big as well. Um, and some of them come in two semi-cell mirror shapes. So if you were to look at the ones that are rod shaped, like you said, the, the, the cucumber shape, it's kind of got like a, 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 div, a divide in the center. Oh, and no it, way. We'll have like a, a, a two semi-cell mirror image as well as the other type of Desmid. And they have names. And is it D-E-S-M-I-D-S? Correct. Desmids. D-E-S-M-I-D-S. -E Desmids. They're a type of Desmids. And these are protists as well? No, those, yeah, they are. They are okay. microscopic, autotrophic organisms, algae. Okay. Um, I think the one that is the bar shaped is called cloisterium. And okay. the, um, the other one, cosmarium, I think. Cool. Desmond's is good enough. <laughs> okay. And they're, they are autotrophs, so they make their own food from sunlight and CO2. Correct. Autotrophs. This whole thing about um, protus, I'm going to have to do a, some more reading about it because it's totally. Oh, yeah. So, wait, does that mean all algae are protists? Uh, I want to say, yeah, but I could be wrong about okay. that. So, like seaweed, what about seaweed? <laughs> Excuse me? Seaweed, like kelp and stuff, is an oh, algae? Um, I think that might be a plant. And okay. also moss. Like moss, I believe, is a plant. Okay. Yeah. Wow. This is really – I always just thought all autotrophs were plants. But um, – Yeah. Wow. Okay. Crazy. And then there's also living organisms like bacteria that do – chemosynthesis so oh yeah they live at the deep vents of the ocean and they're able to get their energy through chemicals uh, more yeah than without sun that's <laughs> yeah, crazy. Yeah. okay let's see if we can get what other critters we can get okay. in here uh, could you talk about the color oh there went one oh, of yeah, those there was um maybe we can get some uh larger um okay maybe i'll pause no, yeah, um, I did see some ar ar arthropods, um, some copepods. I saw some yeah. copepods in there. Yeah, here comes a copepod. Uh -oh. <laughs> They're fast. Yeah, they swim pretty fast. Um, 
has to do there there is another one it also because it has to do with drag you know it's like swimming through syrup so yeah the smaller ones are going to move slower and the bigger ones are going to move faster could you talk about that the vis oh shoot i lost it yeah. could you talk about the viscosity <laughs> while i try to find one of these yeah okay um yeah drag uh vis viscosity and velocity are heavy factors for these tiny organisms it's like swimming in syrup so the organisms, when they're moving through the water, they have to cope with thousands of different substances that are dissolved from it, like other biomolecules, salts, fertilizers, pesticides, oxygen, uh, fungus, spores, seeds. So there's like trees are nearby and then the, um, the seeds from the trees fall on the water and then they're sinking. Um, pollen, viruses, bacteria, um, I'm going to throw. Uh, and so why? Oh, yeah. Why and is, plastics, pee and poop. Right. So why is it, um, the part that I, I'm confused about is why is it different depending on the size of the organism? Like, why does it feel thicker to them than it does? Like when I swim in water, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like syrup. Yeah. Um, it just, I, I'm not too sure, but I do know that the open water affects an organism's motility. And that's it's the ability for an organism to move on its own accord by expending energy. Okay. So yeah, aquatic, that aquatic locomotion isn't the same for all organisms. I can't get a, uh, one of these, uh, maybe I'll put it in slow motion. Okay. Oh, that's a great idea. Thank you. So you're saying there's two, are there two types that we're seeing here? Cause yeah, there's the one I, that I believe that there is, um, a copepod and I think it's just a different type of copepod, an, an, okay. amp, an amphipod or a water flea. Yeah. There oh, we go, right there. Yeah. <laughs> Can't tell if I um, spoke. I just want to get a quick sketch of that yeah, one. Sure. I can tell it's coming because the water is moving. I'm going to look on my end to see if I can find the market where. Okay. 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 All right. Everyone okay. try to get at least that basic shape. Yes. I'll show you what another, I, I mean. This is another classic. thing about microorganisms. They're easy yeah. to drop. because They're so tiny. <laughs> So this is way, this, I want to make sure I get this relatively bigger than this thing. Um, yeah, you're right. It's like you're drawing these sort of basic geometric shapes in a way. Yeah. And I think there's two tails coming off the back. And then it looks like there's. We're at the 726 mark. So what do you think this, you think this one's a copepod or, or an Yeah, that is a copepod. Okay. Um, it's an arthropod. It is also needs to eat other org. It's a freshwater plankton. It's in the animal kingdom. Okay. All right. So one thing, just a page layout thing here. It's not super important. It's kind of more aesthetic, but it also it affects like how easy your page communicates is yeah. this whole arrow technique was working out at the beginning, but it's starting to get a little bit too busy um, for that to be clear. So sometimes um, doing a little bit of planning in advance uh, with that kind of technique would help. Otherwise you might end up with it being sort of messy, which is not necessarily the end of the world, but um, just wanted to point that out. So you said, what is this one called? Uh, a copepod. Okay. C O P E P O D S. P E P. Correct. O D S copepod. It's in the um, crustacean family, and. Um, it's about, it can be anywhere from a half a millimeter to three millimeters. But when you do take a sample, when I'm looking in the water, I can see them. I can see them with my eyes swimming around. Okay. So does that mean it's macroscopic or is that a, not even a real word? I would say it's still microscopic. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. it is visible to the naked eye. 
Yes, and you can see the um, eggs. So I'm guessing this is a female. Oh, these things back yeah. in the so back these, of it. Yeah, these are eggs. These are egg sacs. Cool. And they eventually hatched. And when I looked um, at some samples in July, I saw very tiny versions of these. So, oh, that's what the babies look like. Have eggs in your back. And um, you said crustacean family. Yeah. I really love their long antennae in the front. Yeah. And they're heterotrophs also. Yeah. They're eating up that algae or they're eating the rotifers or the, you know. <laughs> cool. All right, let's continue playing uh, this video here. You still have it at slow-mo, right? Yes. So it's at the 8.05 8 or 8.15, something around there. It'll come up, it'll pop up again. Okay, there. cool. What about color? What does the color mean that we're seeing? Um, that is from my microscope and it has to do, I'm guessing it might have to do with the way, I, I wanna have the, the sharpest image that I possibly can. So when I'm using my microscope, I'm messing, I'm messing around with the diagram here, letting in more light or letting in less light. So, um, I might be letting in more light. And then there's also like this dimmer switch too. Mm -hmm. So um, if sometimes the colors might be a little off and um, they'll end up looking a little, like if it's a brown or a gray, it might end up looking more like a purple or a blue. Right. So I think for nature journalers, a lot of times we're very focused on color as identity, color identities and, and being that, that being sort of like a fixed characteristic of things is that, does that become less important? Like as things get smaller, like what about those, um, yeah. you know, electron microscope sort of neon. Oh, there it things? is right there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and especially those uh, people who um, share their, microscopic footage on uh, YouTube. It, it just looks so, everything looks so sparkly. Like um, mm -hmm. I was looking at some um, diatoms mm -hmm. under different high powered microscopes and you can see the silica inside the organism and you get a little bit of the bent light and like it's sparkly and crystalline mm -hmm. looking. So um, a lot of um, optics and uh, physics of light come into play when using a uh, microscope, making observations. So would you say that the, the person behind the microscope and kind of behind the camera has a lot of influence on, on the colors and what things look like then? Correct. Um, my microscope also has a, a place here that swings out and it, it swings out. This part here swings out and yeah. put like a blue filter in there and um, it makes things uh, a lot sharper as well but also affects the, the the real colors it might be a lot sharper to see but then it, it affects the what it what it actually looks like got it um i'm gonna share this comment from Ivea because it's really nice oh thank you <laughs> thanks I'm having a good time. All right. Um, let's keep playing this a little bit longer so that people, this might be a point to sort of um, change to the next page if your page is filling up. Oops. For people who want to try this at home, what, where would be a good, other than water samples, what would be a good place to, um, to start? If you have some plants that are outdoors that have like a saucer, like a, a potted plant with a saucer, and there's like some water pooling in that, and you see a little bit of algae, that would be a good place to collect mm -hmm. specimens. 
or if you want to start your own scummy water uh, uh, and uh, um, the scummier the water, the better, right? <laughs> Um, if you do live near a sidewalk puddle, uh, <laughs> um, if your friend has a koi pond in their backyard, or if you do live near a river or mm -hmm. a, a lake, um, you know, bring a tiny jar with you. And if you have a way of, uh, of scooping it or using, um, a turkey baster, a turkey baster, or uh, an eyedropper. And you don't need much of a sample, but you do wanna make sure that you get a little bit of, you don't wanna just get the clear water when you're taking aquatic specimens for freshwater microorganisms. Um, you wanna uh, make sure that you have a little bit of algae in there or a little bit of plant matter or some decaying leaves, um, things like that. There are um, materials that you can buy. Um, like uh, I know when for the Pacific uh, plankton, uh, there's like this plankton net that you can buy and you like circle it around really fast to separate. And so that way you can get like a lot of microorganisms at one time. Um, but those are kind of costly, but I just find that when I get a sample, I just try and get into the thick of it and see if I can get um, all that, you know, schmegma that's at the bottom. And sometimes when you're looking, you know, it might be kind of boring, right? But, you know, you have to be patient also when you are uh, making microscopic, make microscopic observations. Cool. I'm noticing on some of these desmids, the longer ones, like this sort of pale spot in the middle, is that where there's the mirror uh, semi-cells or whatever they're called? Uh, these little green ones here? Yeah. yeah, I'm, I'm the, noticing yeah. Those, are type of, those are a type of desmid. Those uh -huh. are a type of uh, desmids. And uh, I, I'm going to tell you, I wrote the name down. Um, they are called Cosmerium, like okay. C-O-S-M-A-R-I-U-M, Cosmerium. And they have that mirror thing going on as well, right? right. They're two semi-cell mirror image shapes. Um, they have no flagellae. They're mostly uh, mainly solitary, but there are some that are colonial. Cool. And they do great. Come, yeah, very shit. What is your um let me share make sure that people can see your um your you're just Kristen Antonio on YouTube there. Yes, so, I am. Yeah. Um, people can <laughs> um, find if you wanna if people wanna watch, um Kristen needs more subscribers. Yeah. <laughs> um Thank if you. you wanna watch any of these videos later um in Nature Journal from them, then that is a good option. I just posted a link um, in the you. comments. And then I'm going to switch, I'm going to remove this. And um, what I'm going to do just briefly here, um, and correct me if I do anything wrong or whatnot, but I'm just going to do a quick sort of demo of how easy this can be. Yes, um, yes. So like, for example, I was working um, at the nursery yesterday and I was working with this really weird plant. And I was super curious about this like yellow texture and so um with the oh and i also have a piece of this um carnivorous plant leaf because i have these um these pinguicula carnivorous plants that have like the sticky leaves and so i could basically just with this this is that carson one um i think i posted the link before um it's like i don't know it's like 20 some dollars or whatnot um, and it's really easy to use. Um, yes, exactly. That's it that Kristen is holding up right there. Um, and it goes only up to 250X, but uh, down to 100. Um, it is possible to put a slide um, in here and it comes with that. But for this uh, for this leaf right here, all, all I would need to do is if, if this fits in my nature journaling kit, I could just you know pick a leaf um and put it underneath here and you can connect your camera but you can also now you're going to just see the back of my head um hold the hold the light on 
um, and look in here and you could literally be looking at it and drawing at the same mm -hmm. time. And right. what I learned from, from looking at it is that these are, I think they're just trichomes that are creating this fuzz. So they're these like glandular hairs um, all over the plant. And um, there's actually a similar thing going on with the carnivorous plant. And it would be a really cool like joint comparison um, for me to look at those under the, the microscope. Um, and I could also just clip on the phone attachment, which is really easy. And I'll just show you how that goes. So um, here's my phone um, and here's the attachment. And you just, it has these little X's. I don't know if you can see those plastic X's. Mm -hmm. but, uh, they help you see if you're lining it up like a bullseye um, oh, okay. or not. So you can see those X's and you just get it. So it's as close to the middle there as possible. Um, and then that clips right on can show you right now what um, what this will look like. Wow. One of my alerts is coming on that there's a vegetation fire in Petaluma. Oh. It's fire season. Yeah. So look, you can, I don't know if you can see that very easily, but already right away, even without like spending very much time focusing, I can already see some of these crazy trichomes. Um, let me get my, this document camera is not the best at focusing on oh. another camera, but um, you might not be able to see it too well, but right there are the trichomes. Um, and so it's basically a really for, you know, 20 some dollars. It's a really easy way to nature journal stuff that could be like right outside of your house. And just for, I think for a lot of people, um, you know, being able to nature journal things without having to go to like a wilderness area is really useful. Um, so right. uh, I think it's a cool option. And I was really glad that you taught that class um, because I think this is an area that's often overlooked in nature journaling is people are really focused on, um, you know, animals and birds and, and stuff like that. But people aren't really looking at uh, my topic. Stuff. So thanks for like kind of bringing this to the attention and um, you because know, I know that you're nature journaling microscopic stuff, but like if I look on the Nature Journal Club um, Facebook page, there's like less than one percent of stuff is microscopic, but it's all around us. Yes, and I would encourage you, you know, look at a fish scale under the microscope, look at a feather underneath the microscope. Um, I wanted to, um, we were having some technical difficulties earlier, but um, this is a video I took of an organism. Whoa. Can you see? Can you see? Yeah. Uh, this is, I'll, I'll do, I took it a while ago. This is, is that the one that you were going to have us yeah. try to guess what it is? Yeah. So do you see that organism? Weird. Time. So. Uh, here we go. Here's one more time. This is an organism. Are you going to give us any hints like the size? Uh, it is microscopic. <laughs> it is found on my body. It's Does it stay microscopic for its whole life cycle? Yes. It was found on my body. Um... <laughs> Hmm. Um, uh, okay, so is it is it uh is it symbiotic or parasitic? It or? is. It, it is. Um, it definitely is a uh type of parasite. It's a it's a type of parasite that is on my body. It's on everybody's Whoa. body. Uh, newborn babies don't have them. Wow, I have no idea. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, this is, it's a face mite. A face if, mite. If you have clear tape, so this is like, it's not like the matte tape. It's like clear, transparent tape. Uh -huh. And you put it like on the greasiest part of your face. And so I just slept with a piece of tape on my head. 
And then I took the piece of tape off and I put it on a slide. And voila, I found a face mite crawling oh my on my God. Phone. Okay. Yeah. All right. So everybody get a bunch of tape. This would be yeah. great for the, I can tell you, this is <laughs> this would be really good for like, uh, I know you work with uh, high school students mostly, but yes. I can just imagine elementary school students just covering their entire face with tape. Um, right. Oh yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, you can also, they also, um, and there's a nail polish method where you could do it with nail polish, like you put the nail polish on the tape and then put it on your face and then oh. peel it off. But I, I, I kind of lucked out with the organism, um, yeah. still being alive. I, I, I like that. And, um, you, I mean, they're harmless, but you know, if you do have a lot of face mites, you could, you know have breakout so you we will make sure that you know you wash your face with a certain type of uh i forgot a certain type of chemical that cleans the face yeah. mites out of your face but yeah wow. we were crawling with microorganisms and that was one i took of a face mite i think that's one of the the things about the microscopic world that is kind of crazy is that there's so much happening that we have no idea about and a lot of just sort of our mm. thoughts about nature um, developed, um, you know, cause for most of human history, people didn't see these things. And right. so a lot of the ways that our brain works kind of don't really consider all of these things. So just right. another reason why it's a perfect place for nature journaling. Are there any sort of like last tips or like recommendations that you would give people, um, that, for kind of like pursuing this more? Um, just take samples, you know, you could, um, to look, when I did the uh, Wild Wonder Nature Journaling Conference, I shared some samples of some water bears or some tardigrades. Oh, those were really I fun. Among the lichen. So mm -hmm. um, if you scrape some lichen from a tree and soak it in some rainwater or um, spring water, you don't want to use tap water because it mm -hmm. has chlorine in it and soak it overnight, but um, be patient. You know, sometimes when you look under the microscope, it's gonna be boring. And so mm -hmm. you might not have that um, action right away. So, you know, be patient. And um, it's a nice memento if you do go uh, to a lake or a river, you know, bring back a sample of water and, you know, take mm -hmm. a look at it under the microscope. Great. Well, I really hope that like with your your help, uh, more people will start nature journaling this kind of stuff and it will become just a, another part of people's uh, toolkit. And I mean, everybody has binoculars for looking at birds, um, but like so few people, even though these are cheaper even than my cheap binoculars, uh, yeah. so few people are using them. So it's sort of just I, I'm I'm really hopeful that it will become more more common. Yeah. Or, um, you know, during the pandemic, I just so loved your show that you did about nature journaling in your fridge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, Good thing um, I didn't have a microscope, though. No, I, you I, could I, have broken open a peanut and looked at the lead in the little leaf that was uh, yeah. pouring in a peanut or um, looking in the star pattern inside a slice of lemon or lime, yeah. or lemon, you know, little things like that. So. You know, Absolutely. I'll remember there's your fridge too, the microscopic uh, journal as well. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Kristen. And thanks everybody who joined in. Uh, Ivea, Angie, um, Jean was here earlier. Um, all of the folks who joined in today, Zephy, um, Esteban, and Della, thank you all for joining in. And for people who are watching this as a recorded version, uh, make sure you do some nature journaling also and check out some of Kristen's um, videos for more microscopic nature journaling. All right, everybody, enjoy the rest of your weekend. All right, bye. Bye, bye you guys.